Our teeth are not only responsible for mastication, that is chewing of food, but they also help us in pronouncing certain words and shaping our face. Loss of teeth can lead to functional impairments and also social disabilities in older individuals. Proper rehabilitation of the lost dentition should be done keeping in mind that the denture must function in harmony with the remaining natural tissues. So for this, a thorough knowledge of the anatomy is a must. Hello everyone, welcome to the series on prosthodontics by Medical Sutras and today we will be talking about the anatomic considerations of the edentulous maxillary arch. GPT-9 describes anatomic landmark as a recognizable anatomic structure that is used as a point of reference. It can further be classified as the stress bearing area or the support area which is further subdivided into primary and secondary. The primary stress bearing areas have a thicker mucosa and or underlying bone and they are areas perpendicular to the vertical occlusal forces. Whereas the secondary stress bearing areas are areas more than 90 degree to or perpendicular to the occlusal forces but they resorb easily. They are made up of cancellous bone, they resist the lateral forces of occlusion and they are subjected to resorptive remodeling. Next the peripheral areas or the limiting structures help us in deciding the extension of the denture so as to engage the maximum surface area without encroaching upon the muscular actions. Relief areas are the areas that resorb under constant load or they contain certain fragile structures within them. So relief that is reduction or elimination of pressure from a specific area under the denture base has to be provided. This question was asked in INICET November 2021. Which of the following is correct for the support area of edentulous arch? A. 22.96 square centimeter for maxilla. B. 15.25 square centimeter for mandible. C. 45 square centimeter periodontal support area in single arch. Or D. 19.96 square centimeter for maxilla. Boucher's 12th edition states that the mean denture bearing area is 22.96 centimeter square for a edentulous maxillary arch and approximately 12.25 cm square for the edentulous mandible. According to the 12th edition of Zab and Bolander, the primary support area for a maxillary arch is the residual ridge. But according to the 13th edition of Boucher, the primary support areas are the firm tuberosity, the hard palate on either side of the palatal raphae. First, we will be talking about the maxillary tuberosity. It is the distal most part of the residual alveolar ridge and it presents as a hard tissue landmark. It is the primary stress bearing area. The significance is that the last posterior tooth should not be placed on tuberosity while fabricating a complete denture. When the posterior maxillary teeth remain unopposed for a long period of time, there is a lateral and vertical growth of the tuberosity and the area assumes importance when the maxillary antrum extends laterally with undercuts at the tuberosity region. Present bilaterally, they can create a problem in placement of the denture but unilateral undercuts in the tuberosity region can be used for the retention of the denture. The next landmark is the hard palate. The anterior region is formed by the palatine shelves of the maxillary bone which meet at the center to form the median suture, whereas the posterior part of the palate is formed by the horizontal plate of the palatine bone. The horizontal portion of the hard palate lateral to the midline acts as the primary support area and the rugae acts as a secondary support area since it is covered by a thin submucosa and it has to be relieved. The areas that require relief in an impression are the secondary stress bearing areas, the palatal torus, median palatal raphae, mandibular tori, retromylohyoid ridge and undercuts or sharp bony prominences on the ridge. The incisive papilla. The incisive foramen is located beneath the incisive papilla which is situated on a line immediately behind and between the central incisors. It lies nearer to the crest of the ridge at resorption progresses. Thus, it shows 
it gives us an idea about the amount of resorption. It acts as a stable landmark and gives its relation to the incisive foramen through which the neurovascular bundle emerge and lie on the surface of bone. It is a biometric guide giving information on the positional relation to central incisors which are about 8 to 10 mm anterior to the incisive papilla. It also acts as a biometric guide and gives us information about the location of the maxillary canines, a perpendicular drawn posterior to the center of the incisive papilla to the sagittal plane passes through the canines. This was asked in Ames 2018. A complete denture patient complains of numbness in the anterior maxilla after 24 hours of denture insertion. The possible reason is excessive pressure on incisive papilla, excessive pressure on anterior flange, damage to the nasopalatine nerve during extraction and last decrease in video. The correct answer is excessive pressure on the incisive papilla. Next, we will be talking about the mid-palatine suture. It is the area that extends from the incisive papilla to the distal end of the hard palate. During final impression procedure, the raphe is relieved in order to create an equilibrium between the resilient and non-resilient tissues. This was asked in Ames, May 2019. What should be done for CD construction in an edentulous patient who has a thin submucosa or mucosa over the mid-palatal suture. The options are A. Relieve the suture area B. Make thick dentures C. Surgical intervention or D. Add soft tissue liners The correct answer here is A. That is relieve the suture area. Moving on to the peripheral border tissues and contours there are the limiting structures and they include the labial frenum the labial sulcus, the buccal frenum, buccal sulcus, the distobuccal space, the hamular notch and the posterior palatal seal area. First, we will talk about the labial frenum. The labial frenum appears as a fold of mucous membrane extending from the mucous lining of the lip to the crest of the residual ridge on the labial surface. It may be narrow or broad, but it contains no muscle fibers of significance. Sufficient relief should be given in the final impression procedure. During impression procedure, the lip should be stretched horizontal outwards for proper recording of the frenum. If the frenum is attached close to the crest, phrenectomy is done. The main muscle of the lip which forms the outer surface of the labial vestibule is the orbicularis oris. It receives the support from the labial flange and the position of the anterior teeth. The fibers of the orbicularis oris pass horizontally through the lips and anastomoses with the fibers of the buccinator muscle. Because the fiber runs in a horizontal direction, the orbicularis oris has only an indirect effect on the extent of denture. Buccal frenum is a fold or folds of mucous membrane extending from the mucous membrane reflection area to the slope or crest of the residual alveolar ridge. It forms the dividing line between the labial and buccal vestibule. It has muscular attachments and requires more clearance for its action than labial frenum because it moves medially by orbicularis oris, buccally by buccinator and vertically by levator anguli oris. The next limiting structure is the buccal vestibule. It is bounded anteriorly by the buccal frenum, laterally by the buccal mucosa and medially by the residual alveolar ridge. The size of vestibule varies with contraction of the buccinator muscle, the amount of bone loss from the maxilla, the position of the mandible, because when mandible opens or moves to the opposite side, the width of the buccal vestibule is reduced. When the vestibular space that is distal and lateral to the alveolar tubercles is properly filled with the denture flange, the stability and retention of the maxillary denture is greatly enhanced. The buccal flange borders depends upon the movement of the ramus of mandible at the distal end of buccal vestibule and hence the patient should move the mandible laterally and protrusively to make sure that the mandible does not interfere with these functions. Next we will talk about the distobuccal space which is also known as the buccal space or vestibule, the buccal pocket, tuberosity sulcus, distobuccal angle of the buccal vestibule, the buccal sulcus, buccal pouch, 
buccal mucous membrane reflection area and the post malar space. The coronomaxillary space is that anatomic region that lies medial to the coronoid process and lateral to the maxillary tuberosity. It is bounded anteriorly by the base of the zygomatic process, posteriorly by the pterygomaxillary or the hamula notch and inferiorly by the crest of the residual ridge. The coronomaxillary flange of the denture is that portion of the buccal flange that extends from the zygomatic eminence to the hamula notch. The hamula notch is also termed as the pterygomaxillary notch or the pterygoid notch. GPT-9 describes it as a palpable notch formed by the junction of the maxilla and the pterygoid hamulus of the sphenoid bone. It is bounded by maxillary tuberosity anteriorly and the pterygoid hamulus posteriorly. It constitutes the lateral boundary of the PPS area in maxillary foundation and is palpated with the help of a mouth mirror or a tea burnisher. The pterygomandibular raphe is attached to the hamula notch. It is covered by a mucosa and extends from the hamulus inferiorly to the retromolar pad of the mandible. When the mouth is opened wide, the raphe moves forwards and creates a vertical indentation in the posterior border of the denture distal to the tuberosities. This may flatten the denture border immediately lateral to the notch. If the denture extends too far into the hamula notch, the mucous membrane covering the raphe can be traumatized. Now we'll talk about fovea palatini, which are also termed as the ducts of coalescence. They are usually two in number on either side of the midline. They indicate the vicinity of the posterior palatal seal area. It also influences the position of the posterior border of the denture and the denture can extend 1 to 2 mm across it. The posterior palatal seal area is bounded by the anterior and the posterior vibrating lines. GPT-7 describes it as a soft tissue area at or beyond the junction of the hard and soft palates on which pressure within physiological limits can be applied by the denture to aid in its retention. Hardy and Kapoor stated that the retention and stability that is achieved from adhesion, cohesion and interfacial surface tension are able to resist those dislodging forces that are perpendicular to the denture base. Horizontal and lateral torquing of the maxillary dentures can be resisted only by an adequate border seal. The anterior vibrating line is defined as an imaginary line that is located at the junction of the attached tissues overlying the heart palate and the movable tissues of the immediately adjacent heart palate. It is Cupid's bow in shape and is located by the Valsalva maneuver in which both the nostrils are held firmly while the patient blows gently through the nose. This positions the soft palate downwards at its junction with the hard palate. Next, it can also be located by asking the patient to say ah with short vigorous bursts. The posterior vibrating line of the PPS is an imaginary line at the junction of the aponeurosis of tensor villi palatini and the muscular portion of the soft palate. It can be visualized when the patient should says ah in normal unexaggerated fashion. The significance of PPS is that it maintains the contact of the denture with soft tissues during functional movement of the stomatognathic system. It decreases the food accumulation with adequate tissue compressibility. It decreases the patient discomfort of tongue with posterior part of the denture. Compensates for the volumetric sinkage that occurs during the polymerization of PMMA. It increases retention and stability by creating a partial vacuum. It permits normal movement of the muscles and ligaments. It decreases the gag reflex and increases the strength of the maxillary denture base. This concludes our discussion about the anatomic landmarks of the maxilla. In the upcoming video, we will talk about the anatomic considerations of the lower edentulous arch, which is the mandible. Till then, if you found this video helpful and informative, then do like the video, share it with your friends and also subscribe the channel for more such content. Also, you can download our app Medical Sutras for more such detailed notes on dental and medical topics. You can also comment below any other topic that you want to be covered in future.